God bless you. And thank you for being a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Romans has a lot to say about our sin, which is revealed. It's revealed to us that we might do something about it. And this passage that Paul gives us, it's an account of the Apostle Paul's inner conflict with himself. He's very honest in this passage. And one part of Paul pulling in one direction and another part pulling in the opposite direction. You'll see it as we read this text together. It's obviously important to realize that the great Apostle Paul, he's speaking about every believer and the tension that we have with sin. He's referencing individuals who have already made a personal decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Now in Romans chapter six, Paul began his discussion of sanctification by focusing on the believer as a new creation, a completely new person in Christ. Think about that. The emphasis is therefore on the holiness and the righteousness of every believer. Now in Romans chapter seven, we find the great apostle Paul talking about every believer and the struggle that we have. In this chapter, the focus is on the conflict a believer continues to have with sin even after receiving the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. You've asked him into your heart. Paul admonishes every believer, Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. It seems to me that Paul is describing the most spiritual and mature of Christians, those who they're honest as they measure themselves against God's standards of righteousness. And the more you realize how much we fall short, it helps us to realize Paul himself did as well. He uses the first personal singular 46 times. This is his personal testimony. The apostle Paul is clearly giving his personal testimony in this passage. Not only is Paul the subject of this passage, but is a mature, spiritually seasoned apostle. He's honest as he portrays himself. The more clearly and completely Paul saw God's holiness and goodness, the more Paul grieved over his own sinfulness. Now remember, the law reveals sin. You're going to hear me say this several times. The law reveals sin, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free. Paul reflects the same humility many places in his writings. In fact, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul confessed, this is 1 Corinthians 15, for I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Notice his humility as he describes himself. To the Ephesian believers, Paul spoke of himself as the very least of all the saints. And to Timothy, he marveled that the Lord considered me faithful, putting me into service. And he refers to himself as the foremost of sinners. Only a new creation in Christ Jesus lives with such a tension with sin and righteousness, realizing that there's a battle between my flesh and my spirit. Only a, a Christian who really is wanting to walk with Christ, who has a divine nature, wants to live and please the Lord. Now, because you are no longer in Adam, you are now in Christ, you possess the spirit-given desire to be conformed to Christ's own image, to be like him and to be made perfect in righteousness. That means dying to self, selfishness, sin. 
And what is described here in this passage of Romans 7 is a person who has a deep awareness of his or her own sin and an equally deep desire to please the Lord in all things. You want to win this battle. Amen? Now, only a mature believer, a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ could be so described or characterized. Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I treasured in my heart. Your Bible might say, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's God's word that is our first line of defense against sin. The spiritual believer, we're going to read about it in just a moment. The spiritual believer is sensitive to sin because he knows it grieves the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. I trust that describes each one of us. You see, it dishonors God if we just keep sinning and sinning and our prayers are being hindered from being answered when we continually live in sin. Sin makes your life spiritually powerless. The spiritual believer practices repentance. Not only do you practice repentance, but we're honest before the Lord with our transgressions. Every man, every woman. As long as a believer remains here on planet Earth, here in this mortal, corrupted body, the law will continue to be your spiritual ally. You see, the obedient, spirit-filled believer, he greatly values and honors all of the moral and spiritual commandments of the, of the Lord, the Most High God. Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is the compass for holy living, right here. The law reveals sin. That's all it can do. It reveals sin, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free. Hallelujah. Therefore, although the law cannot save or sanctify, the law is still holy and righteous and good, and obedience to the law offers great benefits to those who name the name of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Join me as we pray together. Father, meet with us today as we fellowship around your holy, unchanging word. May we apply this truth to our lives today. May our lives never be the same as we meet together. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you, Lord, for this freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. And amen. Join me in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. Verse 17, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who is wishes to do good. 
For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And may God add his blessing to the public reading of his word. The first biblical truth, the law cannot change you. The law cannot change you. Now, the character of the law is described in four words, holy, just, good, and spiritual. Let me say them again. Holy, just, good, and spiritual. That the law is holy and just, nobody can deny because it came from the holy God who is perfectly just in all that he says and all that he does. The law is good. It reveals God's holiness to us. It helps you and I to see our need for a Savior. The law is righteous and good, but what does it mean that the law is spiritual? We're going to discuss this later on in this broadcast. It means that the law deals with the inner man, the inner woman, the spiritual part of a human being, as well as with the outer actions. Now, in the original giving of the law, way back in the book of Exodus, the emphasis was on the outward actions. But when Moses restated the law in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses emphasized the inner quality of the law as it relates to man's heart. Now, let me push the pause button of this message and just say, I am not talking about the 613 uh, rabbinical rules that were added to this. I'm talking about what God gave us through his holy word. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, we read, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear, that means to reverence the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. The repetition of the word love in Deuteronomy, it also shows that there's a deeper interpretation of the law, and it relates to the inner man or the inner woman our nature is fleshly. The Bible calls it carnal. But the law's nature is spiritual. And this explains why the old nature responds as it does to the law. It has well been said the old nature knows no law and the new nature needs no law. You see, the law cannot transform the old nature. It can only reveal how sinful that old nature is. The believer who tries to live under the law will only activate the old nature because the law cannot change you. Transformation takes place when you receive Christ and out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin, you want to please him. The second biblical truth, the law cannot enable you to do good. The law cannot enable you to do good. Three times in this passage, Paul states that sin dwells in us. And Paul was referring, of course, to the old nature, the sinful nature. It is also true that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and it enables us to live and to walk in victory, something that the law cannot help us accomplish. The law never helped people to live in victory. This is the advantage of the Spirit-filled believer, and we're to be being filled by the Spirit of God. The law reveals sin. Think about it. 
The law can only reveal sin, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free. That's a tremendous biblical truth, an unchanging truth. Now, the many pronouns in this section indicate that the writer, Paul, is having a problem with self. He's writing about himself. This is not to say that the believer is a split personality. No, not at all. You're not. Salvation makes an individual whole, complete. But it does indicate, listen carefully, it does indicate that the believer's mind and will and body can be controlled either by the old nature or by the new nature, the Spirit of God, either by the flesh or by the Holy Spirit. And you choose the one you feed. The statements here indicate that the believer has two serious problems. First, the believer cannot do the good he wants to do. Second, he does the evil that he does not want to do. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 9. This is God's warning to the children of Israel. When you go out as an army, when you leave the camp against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. This is God's warning to his own chosen children. He says, stay away from that evil. Keep yourself from that evil. Now, does this mean that Paul could not stop himself from breaking God's law? Does this mean that Paul was a liar, a thief, a murderer? Of course not. Paul was saying that of himself, he could not obey God's law. And that even when he did, evil was still present within him. No matter what he did, Paul's deeds, they were tainted by sin because in this flesh dwells nothing good. Even after Paul had done his best, Paul had to admit that he was an unprofitable servant. That's what he writes about himself. Paul said, so I find this law at work when I want to do good, evil is right there within me. This, of course, is a different problem from that of Romans chapter 6, which we have already studied. The problem there was, how can I stop doing bad things? While the problem here is, how can I ever do anything good? Those are completely different. And I want to draw your attention to how Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. They had asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, pray then in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now notice carefully, Jesus said, pray this way, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus was teaching his own disciples, stay away from temptation, get as far away from it as you possibly can, and deliver us from evil. You see, evil is always present around us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What Paul is reinforcing as he teaches is that the law only reveals and arouses sin, showing how utterly sinful sin is. Because evil is always around us. It is impossible for me to obey the law because I have a sinful nature that rebels against the law. Even if I think I have done good, I know there's still evil present in me. The law is good, by, but by nature, I'm sinful. So the legalist, and I am not a legalist, I am a biblicist, the legalist is wrong because the law cannot enable you to do anything good. The law can only reveal sin Think about it. That's all it can do. But the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus will set you free. Amen? Now, the third biblical truth, the law cannot set you free. Think about that. The law cannot set you free. I'm picking it up in verse 22 of Romans chapter 7. The believer has an old nature that wants to keep him in bondage. I will get free from these old sins 
the believer says to himself. The believer goes on to say, I determine here and now that I will not do this any longer. What happens next? You can answer that, can't you? That man, that woman, every individual, you exert all of this power and energy, and for a time, you have success. But when you least expect it, we fall again. Why? Why do we fail? It's because we try to overcome the old nature with the law. And the law can never deliver us from the old nature. When you move and operate under the law, you're only making the old nature stronger. And instead of being a dynamic source that gives us power, dunamis, a power to overcome, the law is a magnet that draws out of us all kinds of sin and corruption and evil things. The inward man may delight in the law of God. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe it, thy law. Keep it with all of my heart and make me to walk in the path of thy commandments, for I delight in it. Psalm 119. Now the old nature delights in breaking the law of God. No wonder anyone who's under the law becomes tired and discouraged and eventually gives up. That individual, try as you may, is still a captive. In fact, the condition that the Bible calls that individual is wretched. The word wretched indicates a person who is exhausted after a battle. What could be more wretched than exerting all of your energy to try to live a good life only to discover that the best you can do is still not good enough? You see why we need a Messiah, a Savior, to forgive us of all of our sins? Well, let me ask the question, is there any deliverance Yes, indeed. Yes, of course. I thank God that there is someone who will deliver us. Jesus. Deliverance does not come from a program. It comes from a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Because the believer is united with Christ. Every believer, you and I, we are dead to the law, no longer under its authority. Jesus came, hallelujah, to fulfill the law. So every believer is alive to God and able to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. The law reveals sin. That's all it can do. It reveals sin, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free. The final sentence in chapter seven, it does not teach that the believer lives a divided life sinning with his flesh, serving God with his mind. No, not at all. This would mean that his body was being used in two different ways at the same time, which is impossible. The believer realizes that there is a struggle within our lives, every man, every woman, between the flesh and the spirit. Galatians chapter five speaks of this. But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its mind or its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do the things that you please, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5 verses 16, 17, and 18. Every believer knows that either one or the other must be in control, either the Spirit of God or your own carnal flesh. The phrase, the mind that Paul uses is meant the inward man, the inward woman, as opposed to the flesh, just the old desires. Now, the old nature really cannot do anything good. Nothing good dwells in our flesh. The flesh will never serve the law of God because the flesh is at war with God. 
The spirit will always obey the law of God. Therefore, the secret of doing good is to yield to the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Yielding, surrendering your life to the spirit of God who lives in you. The law reveals sin. That's it. The law reveals the sin in your life. And there's plenty of it. But the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free. You see, freedom is in Christ. Paul actually hinted at this in the early verses of this chapter when he wrote that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Just as we are dead to the old nature, so we are dead to the law. But we are united to Christ and alive in Christ and therefore can bring forth fruit unto him. It is our union with Christ that enables us to serve God acceptably. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now I have a closing thought I want to leave with you. And especially if you've listened to this broadcast and you're a believer, but you're struggling with sin, it's a struggle and you're, you're admitting it personally to yourself. This inward struggle with sin was as real for the great apostle Paul as it is for you today. Whenever Paul felt lost or discouraged, he would return to the beginning of his spiritual life in Christ. Paul would remember that he had already been set free by Jesus Christ. When you feel confused and overwhelmed by temptation and sin's appeal, follow Paul's example here in Romans 7. Thank God that the Lord has given you freedom from the law of sin and death. Remember, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You and I, we can live in victory over sin. We can be overcomers every day in our lives as we yield to the Spirit of God who has taken up permanent residence in your body and in mine. Thank you for studying God's Word today. Pray that you will become a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask God to make his word come alive to you. He'll do it. He'll do it for you. Now, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to get saved. You need to ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. He'll faithfully and justly forgive you of all your, trans, your transgressions against him. Ask him to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and you'll be placed into God's forever family. Do it today. Make a decision to follow Christ. It's the best decision you will ever make. Thank you for living generously. Thank you for living boldly. You and I, we are the church. We're to represent Christ and advance his kingdom every day, everywhere we go. So until we meet again, choose to live for Christ. Heaven, I commanded you, heaven, I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, be strong and courageous.
go